Let's learn about bubbles. What is a bubble? A bubble is formed when for any asset, the price of goods for that asset continues to go up, not because the fundamentals of the asset or the, there's a fundamental improvement in that uh, asset that you own, but because you have a belief that the price will keep going up. If you believe that the price will keep going up, you know, you expect that you will sell before the bubble is burst. So there are lots of bubbles like there was a housing uh, market had the price bubble in from 1999 to 2006 7 and these bubbles happen for various reasons human beings make decisions not purely to maximize utility that we have learned right there are three parts on how the consumer demand a theory of consumer demand you know assumes these three things it assumes that Consumers have clear preferences. They know what they want. They want good A versus good B, this car versus that car. They have a limited income and thus have a financial budget constraint. They want to maximize their utility or satisfaction of goods that they choose based on their preferences. So maximizing utility is not always the case. And that's why you see these bubbles being formed because there's this big aspect of behavioral economics that is missing on this theory of classical microeconomics, which is human behavior is complex. And we make a lot of decisions that are not utility maximizing. So let's look at that to really understand what could be going on here, right? Why would someone bet on something that has fundamentally less value just because the price, they believe that the price will go up, right? So there are these aspects of human behavior that we need to understand. And there's this new field of behavioral economics that has these new concepts that we should learn to understand that, hey, this, a lot of decisions we make are not utility satisfying or utility maximizing, right? Simple example, let's start with this one, fairness. If you think, if you think that uh, uh, you, you know, you're in the market to buy a shovel uh, to, you know, take the snow out. And typically that, that shovel, you know, costs you $20. Let's say $20 is the price. And typically, so there's supply and demand, right? And for a given price, you have it's quantity demanded. And let's say the equilibrium is at $20. $20, you sell 30, 30 units. That's the equilibrium. But what you find out is that on a given day, there is a lot of snow. And so what happens is the demand for showers go up. And so the demand curve moved from D1 to D2. So typically, you'd expect that the same $30 would now be sold for let's say hundred dollars, right? Typically, if thirty units would, would be sold at us, would be you know um, those thirty units will will be you know sold at a much larger price. It's where the demand curve and the supply curve intersects, right? And so you expect that the price would go up, but if someone start to sell the the shopkeepers would start to sell that shovel that used to sell at twenty dollars to let's say hundred dollars. What do you think will happen to you and me as consumers? We will think it's not fair. That this shopkeeper is trying to take advantage off of me, and so I'm not gonna buy that shower, right? And so what happens is that the demand curve just doesn't shift up that way. It actually has a cap at $60, where consumers, let's say, feel that beyond 60, this is just unfair. This person is taking advantage of me. And so even though you need that shower, you will not buy it because you think it's unfair. And so, and these demand curves don't shift this way, right? And so that's the problem. That's the problem. See, the, it, there is no curve shifting the way we expect it to shift because we think it's not fair. And there are many such examples of fairness. If we think that we are not being paid as fairly, then we will not do the work even though we want that work, right? Um, and when we tip at a very far off highway restaurant, if we tip at that restaurant, you know, that's also not like, we think it's fair to give someone a tip, but then there is no utility maximization here. You're never, probably never gonna go back to that same restaurant. That person you're tipping will never know that, uh, you know, you tipped them or they'll probably forget. But you really feel genuinely good of tipping that person at that time because they did good service, so you tip them. And then charitable giving and volunteering time. Volunteering time and charitable giving are really good examples. 
I'm creating this videos. Do you, do you know how much time and energy goes in creating these videos? Versus like, so that's me volunteering because I love doing it. That's my human behavior. I love creating content so that it's super easy for people to learn and then they understand the intuition behind stuff and then they get really good at it. So that's my reason for doing it. Is it utility maximizing? Absolutely not. I will be making much, 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 much more money instead of doing this. But I love doing this and so I'm doing this as part of my time. So some examples of human behavior just not possible to model with this utility maximization constraint, right? And so similarly, behavior economics, we learn a lot more things like reference points and consumer preferences. We make decisions based on reference points as to you know what is the perceived value of something versus the actual value. Let's say you are moving from California to Texas. You will make housing decision whether you buy a house or not based on your point of reference of California. Things will look cheap. So your reference point is California. You will buy things in Texas. You will feel it's cheap when it comes to housing. Endowment effect. Let's say this is a spin in a shop uh, that I have not yet bought. And you know there's a, there's a value for this pen. Let's say $10. Once I have bought it, I think the value of this pen goes up much more than $10. Someone has to give me more than $10 for, for them to get my pen. So that's endowment effect. Value of things that you own is somehow increases its value than its intrinsic value, right? For the things that you not own. Third, so again, very hard to explain with classically consumer demand uh, theory. Loss aversion. If we were to gain $10, doing a stock market transaction. And if we lost the same $10, we would be net net feeling worse. Why? Because that loss of $10 feels to erode much more of utility than the gain that we got from that exact same dollars. You're net net zero, but you feel really worse off. So that's loss aversion. Um, and that's what makes us not sell certain loss making investments, even though when we know we should be exiting those investments and getting into better investments, we made a wrong decision. Framing. When you have to make a decision to buy a cream, let's say a cream that you apply on your face, if it's framed as something around youth or something around like, hey, it helps reduce your, um, reduce your age or reduces your aging. And, it's, and versus it's framed as it's gonna make you young. Now, the making you young feels like the right framing to make that decision to buy. If something is sold as and is emphasizing the youth aspect of it, you want to buy that more than if it's framed as reducing aging or something bad, right? Fairness. We talked about this $20 shawl for $40. You, you won't buy it even you know, beyond a certain point. Rules of thumb. We have a lot of shortcuts and we have a lot of biases that we have. Like for example, for me, my biggest rule of thumb is if something's available at Costco, I'm gonna go buy it, I'm not gonna look at the price and not ever compare it to, let's say, Amazon. That's my shortcut. I have built this rule of thumb that says, I'm not gonna calculate expected utility, which expected utility is very difficult to calculate every single time for every single decision. So I'm not gonna even do it. So I'm gonna just use rule of thumbs. Each of these small, small decisions that are made using rules of thumbs continuously make it hard to predict what the consumer is actually going to do. And so even anchoring, let's say someone asks you, give us $10, $50, $20, $200, or $600, either of these options as your charitable donation, you will pick 50 because you think, oh, this is a big difference between 50 and 200, and oh, 10 is too less, something like that. So anchoring, people anchor, people use rules of thumbs. And we make certain things that are, you know, recency biases, like if you hear some news about plane crashes, airplane crash that just happened, then that will increase the probability of plane crash in our heads because we just heard about it. And that, that small event that occurs very less, it's actually very big compared to, let's say, uh, you know, plane crash is actually much, much lower than a car crash. But we think of plane crash much bigger because it's a small amount of time, but we, when we hear it, it's exaggerated in media. So all of these things, human behavior, it's complex. I've just listed six of these, but there's a whole course on behavioral economics that you can learn, and it's a new field. So then, should we just give up on what we learned in chapter three to five about the classical theory of demand? No, because 
this theory has lots of simplifying assumptions. It has a lot of use, it explains a lot of things, but it also has downsides with this evolving field. So as economists and as practitioners of you know modern supply and demand, we'll have to case by case add stuff or remove stuff, certain variables into our model to make it better. Yeah? But that's just an introduction. We will continue to use this as the basis and uh, this is a separate subject in itself. And that helps us make our models better. Maybe this model, the demand curve would be like this instead of this once we learn about the concept of fairness. So we just get better over time. But simplifying assumptions that the theory of demand uh, helps us with microeconomics that we learned in the last few chapters still stays true, okay? Thanks.